San Francisco is one of the most beautiful cities on Earth, but it wouldn't be this way if it wasn't for its unique geology. In this video, we'll take a tour of San Francisco's best outcrops, including Marshall's Beach, Land's End, Corona Heights Park, Twin Peaks, and China Beach to explore the city's amazing geologic history. So we're at Marshall's Beach and it's pretty, you know, it's picturesque. We've got the Pacific Ocean. We got, you know, a massive uh, monument of uh, infrastructure, the Golden Gate Bridge. But the real draw, the real thing that brings people here is that the rock is serpentinite. So when you hear the word serpentinite, I want you to think in your head, subduction. Just make that word association right now. Just, hey, serpentinite subduction, serpentinite subduction. The reason that is, is because serpentinite forms in subduction zones. Subduction zones are areas where an oceanic plate meets a continental plate. Because oceanic crust is denser, it sinks beneath the continental plate and is destroyed by the high temperatures of the mantle. The subducting plate was the Farallon Plate, which started to get pushed under North America during the breakup of Pangaea in the early Jurassic. The rocks in San Francisco were slowly formed on the ocean floor about 120 to 80 million years ago as the Farallon Plate was pushed eastward. They escaped complete subduction by being scraped off of the Farallon Plate into what's called an accretionary wedge. So what happens is that this rock used to not be serpentinite. It used to be uh, a, a mafic oceanic rock uh, making up oceanic crust. And uh, through the process of plate tectonics, it gets pushed outwards from the uh, spreading centers to a subduction zone. And at most, most rocks in the subduction zone, it doesn't go well. I mean, depending on how you view things, if you've got like a, like a reincarnation kind of um, uh, philosophy, then maybe it's a good thing. Um, if you're kind of the, you know, heaven and hell kind of thing, it's bad. I mean, this is literal hell for rocks. It, it's it's uh, the magma inferno of the uh, the mantle. But that didn't happen to these rocks. They survived. Um, and we know that, first of all, because they're here, right? You can see them. Um, and secondly, um, because what happened is that these rocks became accreted onto the North American plate and escaped uh, complete subduction and um, destruction. But something happened to them as they um, were joined on to North America, and that's metamorphism. So um, these rocks used to be probably darker in color, um, but what happened is that the minerals changed. They became serpentinized, um, which means uh, it, it, it joins into the serpentine um, minerals that form, and um, that gives them its kind of a green appearance. It also has kind of a waxy appearance. Um, and that's kind of also why it's called serpentinite because of a serpent, I guess. It kind of looks like a snake. Uh, additionally, you've got seawater that mixes in and it changes the minerals as well. And that's what creates uh, serpentinite. Now, how does it get to the surface, right? And um, an interesting thing is through this metamorphism and this incorporation of water, it actually makes the rock less dense. It used to be that dense mafic rock, no longer the case as much. And um, because it's not as dense, it actually wants to rise up and, uh, and uh, uplift the rocks around it. So we can find it at the surface and it also forms um, some of the hills around Southern Calif Central California coast um, because of that uh, change in its density, uh, which can lead to it wanting to rise, which is uplift. So there you have it, serpentinite. It's a beautiful rock, just an absolutely gorgeous rock. You can also see serpentinite underneath the Golden Gate Bridge at Fort Point. Serpentinite was once mafic rock within oceanic crust. Let's now look at the rocks that formed above it at the bottom of the ocean, starting with basalt, aka greenstone. It's hard to find greenstone in San Francisco. Uh, not too many outcrops. Uh, there's some behind me, but it's at the bottom of the cliff. I got a baby, so I'm just gonna show it to you from here. See if that works. So I found some greenstone, it's behind me. It's also super windy here. Hard to get to at the edge of Land's End, the end of Land's End that is. Um, greenstone is basalt, lava rock that had uh, erupted uh, in a submarine setting. Basically it's, it's uh, spreading centers um, far out into the ocean gotten pushed this way and under the ocean as it was forming uh, some of the seawater got in there altered it a little bit partially metamorphosed it and it gave it this green color 
which is why it's called green stone. Um, but anyway, it's basically basalt. So we've got lava rock, uh, but it is from a um, uh, marine setting. This is, this is volcanic rock that emerged from under the ocean, got pushed out here, uh, and accreted onto North America. I gotta get out of the wind, my, <laughs> my poor baby. All right, so we are at Corona Heights Park. It's got a nice view of the city, but uh, don't check that out too much. The cool stuff is, again, the geology. What we got here is banded chert, and it's a rock that once you know what it is, you're gonna start to see it popping out all over the place in San Francisco. Uh, you find it basically in the south of the city where we have these large hills, such as across the way here. But uh, this park is one of the uh, easiest places to see it because it's not covered in, in trees. Um, things that give it away is, first of all, it's red color. Um, so I'm not sure how well this pops out in um, this video here. But um, the church in um, this part of California have a very reddish color. They can be many other colors, but here they're distinctly red. Uh, and secondly, um, they're banded church, which means that they have these really strong uh, laminations, these strong layerings um, within that that really pop out and make it look like basically giant sheets of paper in a book um, that we can see in the banded shirts. So where did the banded shirt that we see here come from? And the answer is that uh, it came from underwater. Uh, we know that this area used to all be underwater because the shirt itself is made up of uh, basically very small fossils of marine organisms called radiolarians. Um, their, their skeletons, their bodies, are made out of silica, which is the same material that glass is made out of. So unlike um, most kind of marine organisms that use uh, calcium carbonate in their shells, um, they use silica. So they have this basically like a glass body. When they die, uh, these microscopic radiolarians, they all pile up at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean and there's nothing going on in the middle of the ocean except for their bodies piling up. And over uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, as the ocean slowly gets pushed towards the continent through plate tectonics, their, their bodies pile up more and more and more, they get buried, and they actually solidify into this silica goo, uh, which becomes the rock that we call chert. Another thing that banded chert is known for here is its folds. Um, and folding is what happens when instead of faulting, where rock actually snaps and breaks, uh, the rock layers that were formerly horizontal uh, are either compressed or pulled apart, causing them to basically make kind of waves and ripples um, and folds, which is what we see here. So this is one of many small faults in the area. And you can see where the rock broke, which is what we call the fault. Um, and one rock was put up on top of the other. So I believe this is a thrust fault. It's hard for me to really figure it out just with such a tiny fault like this. But what we notice is that one side of the fault um, has rock folding into it, uh, meaning that as these uh, layers were feeling compression, they first started to bend, they started to fold and try to accommodate this pressure, but it came too much and they actually snapped. And you can see over here how uh, on the uh, other side of the fault, uh, the layers are horizontal, but as they approach the fault, they actually start to become almost vertical um, as they really couldn't take it anymore and the fault broke. Um, and so as we get this basically compression of the rock, one rock pushed against the other and it pushes one side up, that is how you get the hills of San Francisco by rocks over thousands of years getting pushed up on top of the other, creating topography. A good place to see chert and basalt in the same place is at Twin Peaks. So if you look at the soil on this side of me here, you can see how it's kind of purple, uh, reddish color, the same color as the chert. I turn right here and the color becomes this kind of brown color. It loses the red. So right about here, I'd say is the contact between the chert and the basalt, but the rock isn't strong enough to outcrop. So we kind of have to just deduce it from what's going on in the soil. But right there, that's the outcrop of basalt. We know we've got basalt right there. And at the top of the hill, that's definitely chert. So we're within a meter or two of it, I'd say. 
uh, right around here. Although it doesn't look like much, this contact marks the time when radiolaria started to build up on top of basalt and initiate chert formation. If you visit Twin Peaks, keep an eye out for the many faults that crisscross this area and play a role in turning Twin Peaks into peaks in the first place. So to recap where we are in the geology of San Francisco, we first have serpentinite that was once ultramafic rock deep within the oceanic plate. Then basalt formed atop the plate at mid-ocean ridge volcanoes. Chert then formed from radiolarians piling up at the bottom of the ocean over millions of years. Once the oceanic plate got close to North America, the next rock formed, Grey Wacky. A good place to see Grey Wacky is China Beach. So I'm at China Beach and the rocks here are Grey Wacky, which is a type of sandstone that has kind of an odd makeup. Uh, in addition to sand, it's got a fair amount of silt and clay which is weird to have all those different um, size classes in the same rock. And the thing that explains it is that these formed uh, as turbidites, as basically stuff on the edge of the continental shelf of North America that would uh, at times basically fall down uh, further down in the ocean and kind of like an underwater landslide. And it mixes up a lot of different uh, sizes of sediment altogether, which explains why we have gray wacky here um, right against the coast, right in the subduction area. While you're at China Beach, check out the sea caves that have geological origins. So check this out. This sea cave exists because there's a fault right here. Right where the fault meets in this image is where water and waves over thousands of years have exploited this weakness and created a sea cave. We're gonna go check it out. Father and son in the sea cave. Never mind, we're getting out of there, Scooby Doo. This guy's the Shaggy. Perhaps I am the Velma? Sea cave. There are many other small faults at China Beach which have mixed up the rocks to bring gray wacky, chert, and serpentinite all close together here. This faulting was a result of compression as a chunk of oceanic plate broke off during subduction and formed an accretionary wedge onto North America. And the Merid headlands across from San Francisco, the bodies of rocks within the accretionary wedge, called a terrain, were largely preserved. Within San Francisco, things are a little more broken up, but you can still see the general outline of terrains where chert, basalt, and serpentinite outcrop within the city. So the geologic story of San Francisco began over 100 million years ago and far away, as rocks formed at the bottom of the sea on an oceanic plate that was slowly being driven toward a subduction zone. The rocks in the city today escape subduction through accretion onto North America. When we see rocks in San Francisco, we're seeing what the bottom of the ocean looks like, as well as what goes on in a subduction zone. The rocks were then pushed to the surface through uplift as well as movement along the San Andreas Fault, but that's a story for another day. Thanks for watching and make sure to subscribe to Poopy Archaeology for more videos about the past.